Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and supporters of Fulbright University Vietnam. Thank you so much for being here with us to share our um, desire and our wish to introduce a very important course uh, to the Fulbright University Vietnam, which is ethic course for all the students, undergrad and graduate. Probably now ethic has become a very pressing issue in our life. It is not only in our daily life for many, many years in the history, but then especially with the very fast advancement and changes of technology, ethics once again has become a topic that requires a lot of revision and re-looking uh, re at. So we talk about ethics in artificial intelligence, ethics in neuroscience and medicine, ethics in media, ethics in writing, even in books. So some of the definition of ethics we have been used to in our life now have been questions whether they are still relevant or not. But at the same time, we always believe that ethics must somewhere, somehow have a universal value and universal definition that we all, as human beings, we should apply ourselves to. With that idea in mind, at Fulbright University, in our education, one of the very important part of our curriculum and our education is to build the so-called the values in students. Not only knowledge, not only skill, but values will be something that will help them in their life, we believe. And with such intention in mind, we launched 2019 speaker series with the theme Ethics in 21st Century. And we hope that for 2019, we are going to be able to invite reputation, uh, internationally known and reputable speakers to come to Vietnam and look at all these topics together with us and help us in building our course and make it relevant for students here at Fulbright University. And with that note, it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Puet from Harvard University, I think, to our first speaker's series lecture. Professor Puet is a household name for all the students who have, I think, the the fortune and then the luck to enter Harvard. His course has become so popular that the students consider that um, they need this course. In addition to introduction to economics, of course everybody wants to make money, and educations to uh, introductions to computer science so that they can apply to a job like Advin again. But then right after that, Ethic course, the course run by Professor Puet, has become the most popular at Harvard College. And that raises a question, why? And of course, we are also here with you to find out the answer why the, 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 the course has been so popular and so in such a, such a high demand at a university like Harvard. But then again, thank you, Professor Puet, for being here and for being so generous with your time, for your willingness to help us to build, I think, a credible and interesting, not at all boring, um, ethic course so that all Vietnamese students can also enjoy the same fortune like the student at Harvard. Thank you. So thank you so much for the introduction. Much, much too nice, but deeply appreciated. 
and thank you at a larger level. I've been here at Fulbright University for five days, and only in these five days I can say already, this has been one of the single most inspiring experiences I have ever had in an educational environment. The teachers and the students here are extraordinary, trying to envision what it means to think of a new university, to think through what that curriculum should be, to think through what the courses should be, to think through how to design a classroom, how physically <laughs> to place desks within a classroom. And by posing those questions together as a group, this has been, again, I've only been here for five years, an unbelievable experience to see what can happen when people devote themselves to thinking anew. So thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to everyone at FUV for all that you are doing, and thank the rest of you for joining us. I know one of the FUV goals is to do outreach programs and to think of education not simply for those lucky few who are physically here, but at a larger level to the larger public to learn and think together. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. And let me also explain logistically, I will periodically be pausing so our, our translator can translate. So, so after I sp say a few words, I will pause as I will do so now. And, th and then I get the wave when to go forward. Great, so we will move on. Thank you. So what I will be speaking about today is indeed ethics. Ethics in the 21st century ethics in a 21st century that will, hopefully, be a cosmopolitan century. A cosmopolitan century in which we will all, again, I hope, be trying to learn from each other globally, be trying to learn from the best practices that have developed in cultures around the world, also learning from the mistakes that we have made throughout the world, and hopefully together as global citizens learning to live ethically. Now, having said that, let me begin with um, another point of view, a point of view I will be critical about. There is a vision of ethics that I think it's safe to say has become completely dominant in the US where I live and has certainly taken on a global reach more recently. And it's one that I personally think is one we should question, one that I personally think is limiting. And so let me take a few moments to describe ethics as I was taught when I was being raised in America. Much of this, as you will see, has taken on a global resonance. And then I will turn to some other possible ways of thinking about ethics that at least I hope will be more cosmopolitan and I hope will have a more global reach. Oh, okay, so I'm now being asked just to continue speaking, but I'll try to speak slowly to give the simultaneous translator um, a little bit of time. Great, thank you. So let me then begin by saying a few words about ethics as I was taught them when I was being raised in America. And since this was America, you won't be surprised to hear it was totally, purely, completely based upon the individual, the individual self. And here was the rhetoric I was taught when I was growing up. I was told, how do you become a good human being? It's simple. Look within and find yourself. Find your true self, I was told. Find your true self and discover who you really are. Find out what you're good at, what you're talented at, what you're naturally gifted at and find out what you're not talented at, what you're not very good at, and love yourself and embrace yourself for who you are. Love your good sides, but love your bad sides too, because it's just you. And not only was I told that, we had a whole institutional arrangement when I was growing up to help me find myself. Let me give you some examples. I took personality tests. 
personality tests that would tell me who I am. Personality tests that would say, okay, we're going to test to see what kind of a person you are going to take this test, and at the end, you will be told who you are. This is really true. And you get a little printout saying, you're the sort of person who, and it explains your personality. You're shy, you're outgoing, blah, blah, blah. And it tells you what you're good at, what you're bad at. It gives you a list of careers that you should follow based upon what you're good at. And you get a list of careers not to follow because you're not very good at these. And the whole message was, by taking this test, you'll find out what you're good at, you'll find out what you're not good at, you can then focus your life on what you are good at, and then when you get to college, then you will spend those four years focusing on what you're good at, because that's who you are, and from there, you will get the training to be launched into your career, and by definition, we were told, you will have a successful career because it will be based on you, who you are, and by definition, you've now avoided all the things that you're not and that you're not going to pick about. So I was told this. And I was told this is ethics because if you do all that I just mentioned, you'll have a successful career as we discussed, you will also be a good person because you'll always be true to yourself. You'll always in a situation do what you're good at doing. You'll know again not to do things that you're not good at. So if you're shy, you'll know not to be in situations where you really need to speak up. Or if you're outgoing, you'll know it's fine to be in situations where they need someone to speak up because that's you. And this is what I was told. Not only was I told this, in fact, as I mentioned, the institutional arrangement was based upon these ideas. And indeed, when I went to college, lo and behold, the curriculum was based upon this because you were tracked to do things based upon what you were good at doing. Now, as you can probably tell from the tone of voice I've been using, I think this is horrible. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible for a few reasons. The first, which I was beginning to think about as I was being taught this, is the thought that, well, you know, maybe I'm maybe a more complex person than this little printout on this personality test is telling me. So I had a kind of sense early on that maybe this was a little bit you know, limiting. But then, I started, yes, reading about global philosophy. And I started reading about ideas from around the world. This, by the way, was not something I was told in my personality test I was necessarily good at. I think global philosophy was not part of the computer program. Nonetheless, I did it anyway. And I then began to realize maybe not just was this a limiting way of thinking. Maybe it's a dangerous way of thinking. Maybe it is a wrong way of thinking. Maybe it's a vision of ethics that is actually very dangerous. And I began reading more and other visions about ethics. And I will now put it in much stronger terms. I actually think there are visions that have developed in world history about how to become ethical human beings that give a profoundly different, and I would argue more importantly, profoundly correct vision of how we can become great people that leads to, returning to the educational sphere, a very different way of thinking about education, one that FUV is actively promoting, and hence my excitement about being here, and leads to a very different way of thinking more broadly as well about how we can be truly global citizens. So now let me turn to what at least I would think is the more exciting way of thinking about our lives and how we can become great human beings. To do this, 
I need to forewarn you about something. I'm going to take you through a different way of thinking about the self that, and here's the forewarning, um, the first few sentences of which, actually more than just a few sentences, the first few minutes of which are going to be a little terrifying. This will not sound too exciting or too inspiring. The reason I'm going to take you through this is because I think the view that I'm about to give you, developed largely in Asian philosophy, is onto something, and it tells us a lot about how I suspect most of us do, in fact, live our lives, which, I would argue, has little to do with claims about finding a true self and doing what we think we're naturally good at doing. So, let me take you through some ideas that arose in Asian philosophy about what we're really like as a human being. Do we have a true self that we're born with, with inherent gifts of what we're good at and bad at, that we should spend our lives loving and embracing and living our life in terms of? No. No. Let me give you a counter view of the self. Here's what we are. We are a mess of different energies. A messy mess of different energies. We have these energies that we can classify as things like happiness, anger, sadness, joy. They're just energies within us. And we have tendencies and dispositions and faculties all of which, by definition, when we're born, are totally undeveloped. We're all messy messes of energies. That's what we are as human beings. And then from a very young age, we begin acting around other human beings. We meet other human beings. We interact with other human beings. And the ways we interact with each other drags out different emotions. So, we'll feel happy or sad, angry, depending on immediate people we meet. We will be taught from a very young age how to act, not because we're told to, but because we'll be brought up in cultures in which we fall into habits of behavior. And those habits, because of these emotional qualities we have, become ways that we experience the world. So we'll go through the days simply repeating these habits that will bring out these different emotional responses. And over time, we kind of start repeating those habits and patterns because they become comfortable to us. And then, the argument is, from again a very young age, we will fall into these habits of acting, and then we repeat them for the rest of our lives. We repeat these habits, we repeat these patterns, we repeat these emotional responses to the world around us, and these become so ingrained in how we act, how we feel feel, how we interact with those around us, that we slowly come to think of them as simply ourselves, simply who we are, simply our personality, or more scarily, when I was being raised, we think of them as our true self. And these habits involve most of what we would call our personality. Oh, I'm just the sort of person who gets angry at little things. Well, from this way of thinking, I may be the sort of person who gets angry at little things. That's got nothing to do with who I am, with my true self, even with my personality. It means I, from a young age, fell into a habit of getting angry at little things. Period. I'm really good at solving big problems. Again, that may be empirically accurate. That's because I fell into habits of being 
that allowed me to think through big problems. I'm really bad at dealing with stressful situations. Well, again, maybe empirically accurate. It's got nothing to do with my true self. It means I fell into a habit from a very young age of being in stressful situations for whatever reason from a young age, such that now I can't deal with them well. Meaning, if this is on to anything, this means that when, for example, I was being raised and being told, follow your true self, define your life, your career, everything based upon who you are, what you're good at, and avoiding what you're bad at. What I was really being told was figure out, through the help of tests, what habits you've fallen into and spend the rest of your life defining yourself by them. That's what I was being told. And even more chillingly, I was being told this is how you will lead a successful, happy life and even more this is how you will be an ethical person. Huh? No. From this perspective, what I was being told was become a, this creature that will just repeat the same habits forever and never grow as a human being. Never grow as a human being. That's what I was really being told. And even worse, I was living in an educational environment that was telling me this is what I should do. Why then do we have education if that's what the goal is? To say, find your patterns and stick to them and never, ever change. That's what I was being taught. So, if this view of the self is onto something, and let me just add, I think it's kind of difficult to say this view of the self isn't onto things. Just imagine, thinking about your life, how much of your life really is just repeating the same patterns. Imagine it's the case that when we categorize people as this person is just a mean person, that person's a nice person, it simply happens. Imagine this view of the self and again, I think when we do, it's tough to say it's not. In which case, we get to the key question. If this view of the self is onto something, what do we do? If our goal then isn't, I would hope, after hearing this view of the self, to find ourselves and devote ourselves to living according to this thing we've become, what do we do? How would we become ethical? How would we think about education? What do we do to become ethical? Well, let me give you the answer that these philosophers developing in Asia argued, and I think are profoundly on to something. And let me just begin by giving you some rather surprising arguments that, again, I think are truly on. Let me begin in particular by giving you a quotation by a philosopher named Kongze, Confucius, who argued the following. He was asked by a disciple, how do I become good? And Confucius's response was, well, to become good, you must conquer the self by submitting yourself to ritual. Now, I must admit, I actually first read that sentence when I was in college being told, find yourself and discover yourself, and I was horrified, horrified. I should be following myself, not conquering myself. And the last thing I want to do is submit myself to rituals because rituals tell me what to do. And the point is, I should be following me, not doing what rituals tell me to do. 
Well, then, after I began reading these texts a lot more, I'm now convinced they're onto something. And let me take apart what they really mean by this. When they say conquer the self, what they mean is conquer the self that simply become defined by these habits and patterns. In other words, what you think you are is not you, it's a bunch of habits and patterns. And if that's the case, your goal is not to follow it, to discover it, to define your life by it. Your goal is to break those patterns, to get out of those habits, to train yourself to sense those around you, to train yourself to break out of what you think defines you as a human being, to, referring back to one of my earlier examples, to see those things you think you're not good at and intentionally train yourself to be good at them. If you think, oh, I'm not good in stressful situations, you don't say, and therefore I should avoid stressful situations in my life and in my career, you train yourself to deal with stressful situations because it's not you, it's a habit you fell into and your goal is to break it. That's what you're trying to do. And if that's the case, why would they talk about things like rituals? Well, let's now talk about what they mean by rituals. We tend to think of rituals, as I mentioned, as things that tell us what to do. It's important to remember that, yes, they do, but the point is you are doing this to break your patterns, to train yourself to be something else. Let me give you a typical American example of one of the rare moments I can think of, in fact, one of the very few moments I can think of, where in America I actually do think we're doing something along the lines that these philosophers would say is wise. So I will pick this rare example where I think we're doing something right. And I will use my poor nephew, who I will give another name to, so he won't be too embarrassed if he actually hears this, but my nephew Sammy. It's not his real name, but I'll call him Sammy. So my nephew Sammy is sitting at a dinner table with me. And Sammy looks at me, his uncle, and says, give me the salt. And I say to him, yes, Sammy, but what do you say? And Sammy stares at me and says, just give me the salt, Michael. And I say, yes, Sammy, but what do you say first? And then finally, poor Sammy, when I do this a lot, will finally say, okay, Michael, please give me the salt. And then I say, okay, Sammy, here's the salt. Now what do you say? And then poor Sammy, we go through it again and again until finally he says, thank you for giving me the salt, Michael. And then I say, you're welcome, Sammy. That's a ritual. Now, you might wonder, why would I say this is a positive example? I mean, poor Sammy is being told to do something, so he is certainly being told what to do. <laughs> Absolutely the case. And Sammy is making it as clear as possible by rolling his eyes and using very nasty tones of voice that he thinks this is just ridiculous. Why won't I just give him the silly salt? Why do we do this? Well, I'll tell you the philosophers I've been reading from Asia, and I will give you their answer, which I think is right. The reason we do this is because Sammy, being very young, of course, sees the salt and wants the salt, and just wants to grab the salt, and he can't quite reach it, and he's little at this boy's age, so he has to get me to give it to him. He has, in other words, a habit based upon a very immediate selfish desires. He's a child. And the reason I force him, and I am forcing him, to do this ritual is I am making him break out of that habit, and I am helping him, by the forcing, helping him to learn what it means to ask something of another human being and to get something in return. I'm forcing him to do it. He's being forced to submit to the ritual. There's no question. And note also the way it's being done. 
I am forcing him. I'm the elder. But of course, in the ritual, I'm acting as if he and I are equals, right? He has to ask something of me as if I'm his equal. I give it because he's asked nicely as if I'm an equal or not. I'm forcing him to do it. If he doesn't do it, I could be you and me and uncle and just send him off to his room or at least not give him the salt. There's nothing equal about this relationship. But in the ritual, we act as if we are equal. And the reason we do this is I am teaching him to develop the dispositions of what it means to ask something of another human being and to get something in return. That's why I do it. And note, and this is where it really matters, note, if Sammy learns the ritual properly, what this will mean is over the next few years, as I continue having Sammy do this ritual, over time, he stops rolling his eyes, he stops using evil tones of voice, he stops even having to be told to do it, and he starts saying, oh, Michael, could you please give me the salt? Oh, thank you so much for giving me the salt, Michael. And it slowly becomes natural. But then the next stage is the important one. Because if he learns the ritual, it means he transcends it. If he learns the ritual, it means he stops saying please and thank you all the time. In other words, if poor Sammy simply spends the rest of his life saying please and thank you all the time, he didn't learn the ritual. He's simply falling into habitual patterns. And the goal of ritual is to break habitual patterns. If Sammy has learned the ritual correctly, it means as he grows even older into young adulthood, he gains a sense in complex social situations of what it means to express these dispositions. Expressions that in most situations will mean you don't simply formally say please and thank you all the time. If someone does something really important, you will express gratitude in ways that go way beyond simply saying thank you, which will seem too formal or too minor. And you're sensing in that situation, how do I express these emotions? In other words, adding this together, the ritual is helping him develop these dispositions. And if he simply repeats the ritual, he's failed to learn the ritual. Ritual, yes, is something you submit yourself to, but it's a training exercise. You're training yourself to develop your dispositions. It forces you to break out of your patterns and learn to sense the world around you. And note, too, it's all based upon as if. It's role-playing. The as-if ritual is an as-if ritual. The ritual is not the world we live in. You construct a ritual space in which, in this example, Sammy and I are simply equals. We're not, but we act as if we are. And that's how rituals work. Indeed, when you look at a lot of the rituals developed out of this philosophy, they involve things like role reversals and role play. They will have, for example, children and parents reversing roles in the ritual space, acting as if each is the other one. There is a one ritual, very telling, in which if a grandfather has passed away, the grandson plays the role of the grandfather, the father plays the role of the son to his own son, because the grandson is playing the role of the grandfather, and the reason you do this is you are forcing each to see the world from the opposite perspective in an otherwise very hierarchical situation. And the idea is by forcing each to literally see the world from the other perspective, it enables you to develop the dispositions of what it would mean to be that other person. Why? Again, because it breaks your usual it breaks your usual way of interacting with those around you. It forces you to see the world from different perspectives. And why do you do all this? As I mentioned, you're breaking patterns. That's clear by now, I'm sure. I 
you're developing different dispositions, absolutely. But imagine we did this. In other words, imagine we were doing rituals along the lines of what we're talking about. Where would it get you beyond Sammy simply learning to express gratitude? Well, where it gets you is something that I think is very important. The argument is, going back to that quotation I gave you from Confucius, the argument is, this is how you become an ethical human being. This is it. Because what you are doing through this, and it's a lifelong work, you're spending your life doing this, oftentimes every day of your life. What you're training yourself to do is not see the world according to the usual habits and patterns. To not simply interact with those around you through the normal habits and patterns you fell into as a child. To rather sense those around you as being what they really are, which is messes. You sense the world around you as being what it really is, which is a very altering, changing, weird world where messes are interacting with others all the time. And why would that matter? Because what you are really beginning to realize is the following. When we are acting in the world, because we are messes, and we're all interacting with each other mainly by habit and pattern, what you begin to realize is that little things we're doing are affecting those around us all the time. We're setting off their patterns, right? And so when I say that person is mean or that person is nice, to use my earlier example, what's really happening is when I interact with that person, I'm setting off a habit in that person of being very mean <laughs> and this other person of being very nice. It's got nothing to do with who they really are. It's a habit of interaction that I've fallen into, which also means once I'm beginning to sense this, to sense that they really are messy, I begin to sense how I can alter how I interact. I can begin to sense how, by acting slightly differently, I can begin to work with them. Just as Sammy is learning from a very young age, how, if he asks for something in a different tone of voice, it brings out a slightly different response. And Sammy is learning that in the ritual that he's being submitted to, no question, but he's being submitted to by not being Sammy and learning in practice to train how to interact with others differently from his normal responses. And where would all of this take us? Let's imagine we really, really did this. In other words, literally spent every day of our lives doing this. Where would it get us? Well, let's go back to our example. Our example was the following. How is Confucius himself described in these texts? You might think, well, probably is kind of a ritual fuddy-duddy because he's doing rituals all the time. No, it's the exact opposite. Let me give you the word that's used to describe him. Joyous. Joyous. He is described as this figure with incredible joy. And what they mean by this is the following, and it's a very clear definition, but they'll give lots of stories and anecdotes to, to describe it, that he becomes the person that's taken years of work to get here, but he becomes the sort of person that can, in any situation, sense the situation, sense all the habits and patterns playing out in the situation, and sense how to do something to shift that situation for the better, right? In other words, he walks into a situation and sees this person seems angry, this person seems sad, this person seems sort of kind of scared by, by things going on and, and are kind of cowering. In other words, everyone is limited in some way by the patterns of interaction that have set in in that context. And he will just do something. He will use a tone of voice, he will quote a line of poetry, he will do an action that somehow shifts people's responses, bringing out different responses, and so perfectly timed that it creates a different set of interactions 
in which they become able to connect with each other. Able to connect with each other and able to flourish with each other. And the point of this is he's doing this in mundane situations. Right? In other words, he's doing this, walking into a situation, sensing it immediately, and doing something. Very mundane, very common, very everyday, and yet he's so attuned to the situation that he can do something that alters it, and alters it such that people begin to connect and flourish. And that's the sense of joy. The sense of joy is when you're really connecting with those around you, really connecting with those around you, what comes out of this is the sense of joy. Joy that he has, he's joyous, but joy of those around him being able, for that brief moment, to connect with each other. And then the further argument is, if you can train yourself to do this in seemingly mundane, common situations, it's the same work, literally the same work, that you're doing that enables you to do it at larger levels. You're training yourself to see larger social patterns that are playing out, holding us back in some way, oppressing us in some way. And you're learning to sense those and sense how to do things to begin to shift those. In other words, the argument is, if we are patterned habitual creatures, we don't really see the world around us. We don't really see people around us. We don't really see larger global problems that are playing out around us because we just repeat the same habits and patterns. And what you're training yourself to do is to see what is going on in a very literal sense. To see those around you in mundane situations, to see larger global problems as they are playing out, and sense things you can begin to do to shift them. That's what you're trying to do. That's what ethics consists of. Now, all of this raises lots of questions, but let me begin with the most obvious one. Uh, okay, you may wonder. Um, sure, we can say please and thank you to poor Sam. Um, but in general, we don't really do rituals that much in the modern era. I mean, maybe that's a mistake for reasons I've, I've mentioned in passing because we don't believe in rituals, but <laughs> mistake or not, we don't do them. So how would this really apply to our lives? And you know, we certainly don't do role reversal rituals. And so, so how would any of this work? Well, here's why I think not only can it work, I think we desperately need to learn from some of these teachings. So first of all, do we do the equivalence of these role reversal rituals? No, we certainly don't. But the problem isn't that we don't have pre-given rituals telling us what to do, because note, once you're learning from this vision of ritual, what matters is the training. That's what matters. And are there places where we can do this? Well. Let me mention the most obvious example, because it's one that we are now intimately thinking about physically where we are. Education. That's what education should consist of. Not the way I was being taught education. Not you go to college to be trained in what you're good at and be trained to avoid what you're bad at because you've taken a personality test. You go to college and go through an entire educational experience to break your patterns, to train you by initially forcing you to, because you're forced to walk into a classroom at 10 a.m., you're being forced. But you are going in to be broken from your patterns, to be forced to rethink the world around you, rethink the ways you see the world around you, to be forced to see, in a very literal sense of the word again, see what is going on around you, and you are being forced to finally learn, therefore, by this training exercise, what it would mean to really help to create a better world. At a mundane level, in terms of how you interact with those around you, and at a 
much larger global level in terms of global problems. Problems that, according to this philosophy, and I agree with it fully, you will never be able to help, but frankly never even be able to see if you are not breaking out of your usual habits and patterns. Education. No. Immediately, that raises well, many more questions, but let me turn to what is undoubtedly an obvious one, which is many of you say, may say, okay, well, what about those of us who are sort of past college? Um, I am, and I was certainly not trained this way in college either. And you might think, so does that mean it's kind of all over for us? No. No. If you take this philosophy seriously, this is a lifelong work. Education forces you to do it. You're forced to walk into that classroom again at 10 a.m., but it's something you should be doing all the time. Every moment of your waking life, you're breaking your patterns and you're training yourself to see the world. And it doesn't stop. You don't stop when you're age 22, when you graduate from college. You do it every moment of your life. Because as habitual creatures, we will fall into habits throughout our life. And again, if we never break out of them, we will literally repeat the same habits all of our life. So, when do you do it? All the time. How then do you do it? You do it, again, in this training exercise sense. You, to give some very concrete, seemingly mundane examples, but as I'll explain, that's where it all begins, you train yourself all the time with the very ways you perceive the world and interact with those around you. When I say mundane, well, listen to how extremely I mean this. When you walk down a street, you start training yourself to see things. Literally, you train yourself to see how people are interacting. You train yourself when you greet someone. Note the slight variations in how they will respond. With you when you greet them in slightly different ways. And then you begin working on that. When you see that so-called mean person on the street, you greet them in a slightly different way. Note the different response. And then slowly you start interacting with those around you in slightly different ways. Again, because you're training yourself to sense how things you do are affecting those around you. And, as you do that, you begin to sense slight variations bringing out different responses, and then you're training yourself to see, again, people as what they are, messy, but you're training yourself, therefore, to work with that messiness. And the more you do this, it's a training exercise, the better you get at sensing them, and sensing how to shift situations. And that is ideal identical to the work, beginning at this seemingly mundane, absurd daily level that you were doing at a larger level too. It's the same work that enables you to slowly see larger global problems, see what is going on, and sense how to work on them. This is what it means to be ethical. Now, to explain why I think this matters so much, let me now get to the scary stuff again. Returning to the scary descriptions of what we're like as human beings, and discussing, since I fear many of us don't do what these philosophers are talking about, let me talk about the implications of what the world looks like if we stay in our habits and stay in our habits. This is actually scarily easily done, because the truth is that these visions of the self, that we are these habitual creatures that just repeat patterns all the time, these aren't just ideas that pop up in some philosophy books around the world. It, it turns out, actually, that this is kind of well known by a lot of people who for example, are designing much of the world that we are living in. Let me just give you one example that's already rather important and I suspect going to become 
ever more important in the decades to come. Let's discuss, for example, the internet and social media and artificial intelligence. So let me discuss a company that's become rather big in the world, um, Google. How does Google make its money? It's one of the two or three most powerful companies in the history of the world. Do you know how it makes its money? As you know, it doesn't sell anything, or it doesn't sell physical things. It sells information. Here's how Google works. Google knows you're a habitual creature. Google knows it really well. Google knows every single website you have ever been on, ever. It knows what time of day you went to that website. It knows everything you have ever bought on a website. It knows what you bought, what the style was, when you bought it, where you were when you bought it, and it collates that information, and lo and behold, it discovers, surprise, surprise, you are a very habitual creature. It knows you go to the same websites every day, at the same time. It knows when you buy what. It knows what time of day you're more likely to buy something and when you're less likely to buy something. It knows when you tend to read something and when you tend to flip to another website, depending on the time of day, the weather. It knows all of that and it collates that data and it sells it. And if you think it's a little random that when you're playing on the internet and lo and behold, up pops up stories that just hit the news vision that fits with your thinking, or that an advertisement pops up with a piece of clothing just perfectly fitting your taste at the time of day when you tend to like to buy something, that's not random. It's because every statement you read, every story that appears in your newsfeed, every single advertisement is being designed to manipulate you based upon your patterns. Every single thing you read. In other words, not only are you a habitual creature, but you are being traced, your habits are being found, and you are being manipulated by your habits. And because we don't tend to break out of our habits, we don't tend to do what we've been discussing so far, what this means is you are being kept in your patterns because Google only makes its money if you stay in those patterns. It only makes its money if you click when you're supposed to click. That's why people will pay it tons of money that's why political organizers will pay it tons of money. That's why if you have a certain political view, it will just be repeated because the same news feeds will pop up. In other words, the internet will keep you in your patterns and manipulate you accordingly. That's the world we live in. <laughs> and that's not just Google. I use that as one example Needless to say, we can proliferate this. If we are habitual creatures, and we are, we are also easily manipulated creatures, and we don't even see it, because we just stay in these patterns and follow them over and over and over again. And meanwhile, things go on in the world problems develop in the world that we kind of need to be working on and changing and seeing what larger problems we're creating. Why don't we see them? Because we don't see anything. We repeat patterns. In other words, if we are these habitual creatures, and we are, let's just be honest about this, we are moving into a world where we are going to be much more easily manipulated, because if we don't tend to think of ourselves this way, I assure you, people who are designing things like computer programs, boy, do they know it. And boy, do they use us. 
So, if that's the scary part, let's get back to the exciting stuff. Suppose these philosophies are also right with the flip side of everything I've just mentioned. That in other words, if we're these habitual creatures, we are also luckily creatures that can break all of this. If that's the case, and again, I think it's also empirically undeniable that that is the case as well, then it just raises the ante all the more on this. What it means is it's not just important for us to be personally fulfilled to break our patterns, but that is absolutely the case. It is also the case that for us to be truly ethical global citizens, we must do this. We must devote our lives to breaking these patterns, beginning at a mundane level, but working from there. We must support educational institutions devoted to this. And we must, even after we graduate at age 22, we must continue this work. Why do we have such dangerous global problems facing us now? The horrible, to look at America in particular, horrible disparity between wealthy and poor. The horrific destruction of the climate that may honestly destroy much of the world's population in terms of species within the next two to one to two centuries. How has this occurred? Because we haven't seen what we're doing. We're not seeing the world. How do we solve these problems? I have no idea, but that's the point. We solve it by doing the work I'm talking about. We solve it by becoming the sorts of people that can see these problems and become the sorts of people who can begin working and experimenting on how to connect with others, how to build worlds where we are not creating these problems, how to build worlds where we're trying to solve these problems collectively, we're trying to build worlds where we can really connect with each other. If we don't, these problems will grow. And there's a terminus point to them. And to us, if we begin working on these problems, we can become the sorts of global citizens that could connect with each other and that could honestly begin to solve these problems. That could honestly, to refer back to some of these texts, create worlds where we could honestly begin to connect with each other and to flourish in whatever ways that might mean. This is what we need to devote our lives to. So, what should you do? What you should do is begin with the common, the seemingly mundane, begin there. Because these patterns set in in the common ways we interact with those around us the seemingly mundane things we do on a daily basis. You begin there. You begin training yourself to see these habits. You'll see them immediately. You begin training yourself to break out of these habits. Begin shifting how you interact with those around you. You will begin to, in a very literal sense, feel like a different person within even a few weeks because you will literally start becoming a different person. You will literally start connecting with people, kind of for the first time. You will literally begin to sense people, kind of for the first time. And then you just keep doing it. And out of that seemingly common mundane stuff comes the kind of work you're doing at a larger level to see these larger problems, to see how to connect with people, and to see how to actually begin to create a better world. This has always been the case. We humans have always been like this. The solution, I think, has kind of been the solution we've been discussing. But I think the stakes are now much, much, much higher than they have been before. And if we do this, I do think we, as a human species, could come together and solve these problems. If we do not, it is entirely possible that all life on this planet will be gone in two centuries. The stakes could not conceivably be higher. But going back to the good news, if you begin with your daily life and you begin shifting these practices and you begin training yourself, suddenly, and I mean suddenly within a few weeks, 
everything that seems insurmountable, all these problems that seem insurmountable, suddenly become not only surmountable, they become solvable problems because you can see them and you can begin working on them. In short, this is what I think ethics should consist of. What ethics consists of is seeing the world around you, connecting with those around you, interacting with those around you, building worlds within which we can truly connect with each other and truly flourish. And let me just conclude again by giving a huge thanks to FUV. Never, never in my many years of trying to work with many institutions of higher education, never have I seen an institution that I think is so committed to doing this kind of work. I mentioned before these role reversal rituals. Let me give you an example from Fulbright University. This, the first year of Fulbright University, is one in which the students are co-designers of the curriculum. They are co-designers with the faculty, working together to build the curriculum, working together to think of how to build a classroom, working together to actually develop an entire university. In other words, the students are also the teachers and the teachers are also the students. This is a perfect example of a ritual work that is forcing us to rethink the world around us. So I think this is an extraordinary vision for all of us. And I think we are physically here in the space of Fulbright University, which more than any other educational institution I've ever encountered is living up to these goals. So let me thank all of you for being here today. And let me thank on behalf of all of us, those at FUV for all that you're doing in creating a truly, truly, truly transformational experience for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Puet. I think that I have sat through several of your lectures, uh, that every lecture brought in, I think, a very new way to look at things. And then I think the whole concept of how can you be an ethical person? How can you make ethical decision and for a better world? So thank you very much. And I hope that next time when you return, I think that we will hear another lectures and then probably very different from this one, and share with us how to we keep doing this ritual, not only this year, but then again and again and again. Thank you. So um, I think that now it is a time for the, the questions and answers, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, doctor. So I have a question. Interestingly, you use Google as an example. And Google have a famous motto called "Don't be evil." So, if a company who motto is "Don't be evil," but they manipulating all the billions of users, so in your point of view, are they evil? Wonderful question, and that is indeed their motto. The motto of Google is "Don't be evil." They will explicitly say our goal as a company is to bring knowledge to all humans. Um, they actually, for example, came to Harvard University Library and Xeroxed our books to try to put them online to make knowledge available to everyone. That was blocked by copyright laws, unfortunately. But, but still, the goal was let's make everything available to everyone. And that sounds wonderful. I think by intent, they mean this. I think the intent of the organizers of Google, and I've actually had the, the great fortune to meet many of them, I think by intent, they mean this. I don't think they're being evil in terms of their claims. I think they truly mean their claims. But this raises your question to a higher level of concern, because I don't think they mean to be evil. I think by implication, unintentionally, they're doing incredibly dangerous things to the world. And let me just begin with the key example that they will give as one of their, their great qualities. They will say, but we make news available to everyone. But they don't. What they make news available to is what you already think. I'll give you an example from my country in America. 
In America, we have become, as I'm sure you've heard, a very dangerously polarized country where people have very fixed views and, in a very literal sense, don't understand the viewpoints of other people in America. This is part and parcel of the world of the internet because they will go, they meaning literally all Americans, will go onto websites because they're getting these news feeds from Google and clicking on, on links that Google will send them. And those links are based upon the habits that Google has found that people like to click on, which means if I have a certain set of political views, I will only have news feeds that support my view. I will only get statements and messages popping up that support my view. I will get political advertisements by people who have paid to find out who is likely to be pulled by these political advertisements. Are they being evil? Not by intent, but by implication. They are finding our patterns, they are keeping us in our patterns, and selling that information to people who are going to use us for our patterns. And I think it's a wonderful example. And let me expand it. I think part of what is so dangerous about the world we're moving into is we'll be dealing with a lot of powers who actually aren't by intent evil, that actually may honestly think they are trying to create a better world, and yet because we're habitual creatures, we, on the contrary, are being easily manipulated and perhaps, to use a strong set of terms, being brought into our worst tendencies as human beings. So part of what I fear is this is what's going on. I, I know many people at Google, many of my students, by the way, work at Google and they love the company. <laughs> um, I don't think by intent they're evil, but I think by implication we are allowing ourselves to be manipulated in very dangerous ways by the way they operate. And again, I don't think that's a problem just with Google. I would expand the point. This is why things have reached such a dangerous level. So thank you, wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hello. So we, we come from business perspective. Yes. And I think Google or uh, the controversial uh, Facebook now is just some examples. Absolutely. So ethics in terms of business right now is two sides of a coin. Yes. So if we are business leaders, should we? Uh, we, we have the role to enable a yes. working environment and a culture that very ethical for the employee, right? Yes. So should we confirm that ethics is absolute or uh, it can be a two side of a coin? <laughs> yeah, beautiful question. And let me say, I think it is absolutely true. I think business leaders will be among the key figures that will play a role either way in this. And I think you're right. Um, it, they are flip sides of the same coin. In other words, if we are these habitual creatures, but if we're equally capable of altering them, in other words, if we're these easily you know, <laughs> pliable, messy creatures that can fall into hardened patterns or grow from them, I think one of the key questions business leaders need to ask themselves, themselves are, how do we actually then promote a world where we really could flourish? Um, let me begin with the Google example, but then, then turn to other possible examples. So imagine, for example, computer programmers being trained in exactly the ways we've been mentioned, but then self-consciously begin posing the question, and I'm, I'm very honored to say I have some students who are literally now doing this, to say, how could we, on the contrary, begin developing computer programs that actually intentionally are trying to help people break out of their patterns? That, in other words, would say, okay, if you're the person that only goes to these, these news feeds, we're going to intentionally start giving you other views. If you like this type of music, we're going to intentionally start bringing in other forms of music that you've never listened to, but that actually might, you've perhaps, help bring you out of your normal comfort zone. We're going to intentionally, in other words, looking at your patterns, help break you out of them. And could this be a monetarily successful vision? I think the answer would be absolutely. Like, personally, I would love to go <laughs> to websites that would do this, that would be the equivalent to these rituals, because rituals are exciting. They take you out of your comfort zone. They intentionally would do the opposite of what I mentioned. 
And I think it would be ethically wonderful. I also think it would be a great business model. <laughs> I mean, I, I think people would truly sign up for this thinking, yes, I want to learn new types of music. I want news feeds that give me new ideas. I want to learn new things rather than just being told the same thing that I've been <laughs> told for the past 20 years. I think it would be an extraordinary model. And let me give another example too. Um, note the way when we're running businesses in any organization, Note the degree to which we think in terms of the ways that I began this lecture. Like we will often say, and often it's too weak, we kind of always say this is how we organize things. I'm going to put people into the jobs that they're good at. So we're always saying, okay, I'm gonna promote this person to this job because they're really good at this, but this person isn't so good at this other job because they're not very good at, you know, for example, you know, handling stress, so I won't put them there. What if you actually create a company that's intentionally and very openly, you say this self-consciously, join our company because we're gonna learn from each other and you're intentionally moving people into positions that are kind of a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but in a supportive environment that says, and we're going to work with you to help you grow and develop. And it's the sort of thing that people would find tough and challenging at first, I bet within a year, everyone would want to join that company because <laughs> like it would just be the sort of place where they can oh my gosh this is the sort of place where i will grow in ways that i couldn't right now imagine so adding up these two examples both the sort of you know the the google model but but trying to do the google model in a different way or an organization in terms of how it works it would be a business model that i think number one would be very successful and i think would be ethically extraordinary and I think the two would work together because they would be ethically extraordinary. I think people would find them inspiring. And because they found them inspiring, I suspect people would desperately, they'd want to be part of that organization. They'd, they'd want to go onto those websites to return to the Google example. I mean, I think actually it would be an extraordinary model. So adding this up, um, imagine if this becomes our vision of what we can do as leaders. And in the business community, could we promote growth in this way? And I think the answer is yes. So yeah, thank you so much. Can I have some, one question for this here? Yeah. Uh, you know the... Oh, the, yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> They listen to, speakers, you know, so not clear where the, voices the, are coming from. the big country, China and U.S., is fighting each other. They're like a terror war. Absolutely. What do you think, you know, two leaders like, uh, you know, fighting each other's perspective, you know, global perspective? Is it ethic, the philosophy? What do you think about this? Uh, yes, and I think it's a wonderful example. And talk about a perfect example of people not listening to each other. <laughs> and I, I think it's a perfect example. I'm people not listening to each other, not listening to other voices. And I, I would say the current battle going on between the US and China is almost a, a flawlessly and chillingly so a perfect example of people who aren't really listening to each other. And in each case, I think you see leaders doing what they find, you know, I'm sure quite correctly, to be immediately extremely popular but with incredibly dangerous long-term uh, implications. And are there serious problems between the two countries? Oh my gosh, yes. But they're not gonna be solved by each playing into the other's kind of worst tendencies with each playing on the popular base of doing that. And you're gonna create an ever-growingly dangerous situation. So ethically, what do I think needs to happen there? I think First of all, the leaders need to listen to each other, but also putting it more broadly, the leaders need to see the complexity of both countries. Both countries are complex places. They're messy, big places. Lots of different opinions going on in them. And instead of playing on to each side's sort of worst tendencies, what happens if they begin playing to different tendencies and playing to tendencies that might perhaps desire to work together to solve global problems as opposed to seeing each other purely in conflictual terms. Now, what would this mean in terms of economic disputes, political disputes, perhaps dangerously military disputes? Again, who knows, but that's why you do this. What this means is you need to actually learn to listen to each other and talk to each other and work through conflicts seeing the complexities of the different sides. And I worry that's what's not going on 
And when that's not going on, conflicts don't tend to resolve in helpful ways for either side and certainly for the larger world. So yeah, I think it's a perfect example. Thank you. Great, absolutely. Ah, great. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I totally agree with your point of the lecture today, uh, but I just want to ask. Please. So basically, your premise is that you help break people out of a the, the, the bubble of the self, the self-imposed vision uh, of uh, a self. But then you've given people another bubble, which is an ethical bubble. So do this, and you will become ethical. So it may be bigger, but it's still a bubble. So, and no matter what people try to do or try to be, maybe better, richer, or more ethical, then they are still limited by that very definition of sure. a desire. Yep. Yep. So how do, you, how do you resolve that with, yeah. let's say, another contemporary of Confucius, who was Lao Tzu, he said, truth is a pathless land. So the more you try to reach by traveling, the, the more lost you become, basically. So how, how do you kind of resolve that? Yeah, wonderful question. And, and I love your metaphors, so let me stick with your metaphors in, in answering. Um, I think that's right. I think our danger as humans is we are in a bubble, um, personally, within communities that just will continue that bubble endlessly. And I think you're right. When we're breaking out, isn't there always a danger we're just going to be creating another bubble? And I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> and, and the reason I put it in that, that seemingly bizarre, strong voice is because that's the key point, right? We're never going to be totally free of bubbles. We're never going to create a world where we're truly going to be flawlessly connecting with everyone, flawlessly working together to solve every problem. Because as you said, we may think the best way to solve this problem is by doing the following things, but we're going to create other dangers by doing that. But that's the key. As long as we're aware that that's the case. In other words, as long as we're aware that, you know, to use one of my examples before, in America, how do we solve wealth disparity? There's some clear things we need to do. We need to rethink our financial regulations. We need to rebuild aspects of the welfare state. All sorts of clear things we could do immediately. But by doing those, we're going to create more problems. We're going to create more bubbles. But as long as you're aware that every time you're solving one problem, every time you're connecting with people to solve one problem, you're in danger of creating another bubble, the key is then you're self-conscious about it. In other words, then you're self-conscious, OK, we're doing the following sets of things to solve these problems, and you're self-conscious immediately that, by definition, by doing this, we're going to create other problems, usually unintentional problems that you could never have foreseen, but they're going to occur. And as long as you know that, then you're working on those. And this may sound like a pessimistic vision. I mean, it's saying, sticking with your imagery, we're always in bubbles. Endless work? True. But the flip side of that is the exciting part. It means we can become the sorts of individuals that could be devoting our lives to working with each other, connecting with each other, working on problems, creating pockets for brief periods of time where we're really flourishing, and then we're going to end up creating other problems that we didn't foresee, and we need to work on those. And it means we're not looking for a perfect solution to world problems where we're going to create a flawless great peace where everything's perfect. It means it's endless work, but incredibly exciting and important work. And I'm referring back to, again, that, that one image that, that's so powerful and I think connects well with yours in a kind of intriguing way. There's a joy that comes from that. There's a joy that comes from connecting. There's a joy that comes from realizing, oh, we're creating another bubble. We need to rethink this. And there's a joy that comes from that rethinking. There's a joy that comes from being in a classroom where you're, <laughs> you're constantly rethinking your assumptions. And think of that as a life. Sure, we'll create more bubbles. There'll be dangers in ways we never foresaw. But then you work on those too. And that's a great vision for what we can be as human beings. So yeah, thank you so much. Hi. Uh, yes, please. Hello. Uh, 
First, I want to say thank you to your wonderful speech, and I really enjoy it. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just want to take a, an experience of actually an example of my childhood. Well, Please. I'm only 17, actually, <laughs> and uh, I was a very mischievous child when I when I was young, when I was younger than this. And my mom taught me to do housework. And she taught me wonderful lessons of doing housework. And at first, I was a little bit nervous. And I was like, mom, I don't want to do housework. I don't really want to do housework because that, those are so boring and so dull. But actually, when I put myself into her perspective, yes. and I do housework, and she taught me a lesson that whenever you do a housework, Look at that and think of what you want to do and rethink yourself. Doing things of those and maybe like you need to rethink that is it right or wrong. So yesterday, well, I spoke to my friend, actually my best friend, and I talked to her about like I, I had an ambition of doing something like a model. And she just said like, well, you know what? I don't think that you fit as a model, to be honest. And she said that, like, look at my process and also my ability of doing things like that. And I just say, why do you think that I'm not fit as a model? She said that, well, you just don't look like a model. You're just not a model as a born. You are not born to be a model. So, well, if looking at your perspective and we do a thing like we think of that opinion, so if I just give you an example of what I'm going to do next. So I'm yeah, going please. to take that uh, question, I'm, I'm going to take that opinion into my future. And I'm gonna do like, okay, I'm gonna do some writings. I'm gonna be a writer. And I'm not, go I'm, I'm not going to do a model or I'm going to be a model. So it's kind of hard to understand. Like if you wanna be a model, you're gonna go against that opinion. But if you understand that opinion, if you want to put yourself into the other's shoes, and you understand that, so you will become a writer. So I just want to ask you your opinion about that. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And let me begin by saying, I think your mother was absolutely right about the housework. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think she's absolutely right. I mean, this is so incredibly important. And I do think it leads into your key question. Um, the answer is kind of, and I know this will sound absurd, but I really mean this quite seriously, both and. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, yes, any time you hear a statement, you simply cannot do X because you're not good at it, or it's not what you were born to do, always be aware of that. Now, does that mean, therefore, it is what you should do? Well, that's a completely separate question. But the key is exactly the one you said you were trying to understand why people would say that. You understand their perspective, absolutely. You're trying to sense the degree to which that's based upon a helpful perspective you can learn from, or is it simply a judgment of something you were being thought to naturally be, which is something you should always be suspicious of. And then in practice, how would you answer the question? Um, do both, and probably it's gonna be more than just both. In other words, you're 17. Start writing some, start modeling some, start doing, by the way, totally different things that you probably right now have never even imagined. Start experimenting with things. And you will very quickly find, I mean, quickly you're young, you know, within the next few years, think of this as a multi-year process, that it will have almost nothing to do in terms of what paths you ultimately follow about what right now you or those around you think you're good at doing, or think you're naturally good at, at ultimately being, you'll find no relationship whatsoever. So try writing, try modeling, try utterly different things that you've never imagined, do different activities, read different books, explore things, and don't allow yourself to be guided by preset notions of who you are, what you're good at, what you're naturally gifted at, what you're endowed to be. Explore things, train yourself, grow, and four years hence, five years hence, will you be a model? Will you be a writer? Will you be something we couldn't imagine? Airplane pilot? I'm just throwing out a random example. Who knows? But allow yourself to go through that process, and that's what really matters. 
And out of that will come things I suspect right now you couldn't even imagine. And that's where the excitement comes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hello, Professor. I am interested in about this topic, but it's more about the business. That, Wonderful. Yeah, there is always conflict of interest in being ethic mm -hmm. and business, even Absolutely. in private business or trade world. So how this philosophy can compromise in the business practice? That's my question. Yes, a wonderful question. And immediately I would say, uh, of course, there'll be a conflict. I mean, there are conflicts in everything we do. There are always going to be conflicts. There will always be tensions. That's what life consists of. But what I would also say is, I think it's not going to be the case that always the economically wiser decision will be the one that's not also ethical. In other words, it's really worth thinking about the degree to which what seems immediately most economically advantageous, which oftentimes may not seem to be the ethically right thing, it's always worth asking yourself, is what seems immediately the most economically advantageous really the one that's most economically advantageous in the longer run? And I do think it's worth asking, in the longer run, would a more ethical vision, in this, this sense of ethics, a more ethical vision that's really trying to create contexts that are breaking people out of their habits and patterns, both, again, within your organization as well as how that organization is doing its business work, if that isn't going to open up longer term, greater possibilities? And I think often the answer to that may end up being yes. Um, again, to, to return to the poor Google example, I, by the way, again, I really do have lots of friends who work at Google who, who love it. Um, but to return to that example, I mean, I really honestly think Google would be an even more successful company, although it's tough to imagine how something could be more successful, but I actually mean this, if it actually began self-consciously doing what we're talking about and actively becoming the sort of company that would really be helping break people from their patterns. And that would seem to be immediately economically insane, because they've got a great business model, <laughs> to put it mildly, um, why would they want to break that? Well, they might want to break it because as slowly in the past year word has gotten out what's really going on, there's going to be a backlash that's already occurring. And if they begin to shift, and if they'd begun to shift, say, five years ago, it would be a very different company, and I think would have a brighter future. Facebook is another example. I mean, I, I know lots of people who are dropping Facebook because now they're finding out what Facebook has been doing. Um, imagine if Facebook five years ago had been rethinking this model. I actually think it would have grown more and certainly would be growing more than I think it's going to be going in the next five years, which is going to be hardly going to be growth, to put it mildly. So I think it's always worth asking yourself, could a successful longer-term business model involve ethics? and involves things that seem not immediately as economically advantageous, but in the longer term may allow more excitement both within the organization and in terms of its larger vision, which in the longer term can be in incredible for a company in ways that, again, we couldn't yet really imagine. And I think if we're always asking that question, I think the answer might be yes more often than we tend to think. So yeah, thank you. Of course, yes. Hi. Um, so, in your speech just now, uh, you were mentioning a part about rituals. Yes. And um, just, just to make sure I understood what you say. Um, so, you were saying that ritual helps people um, force them out of their own patterns. And also, the role reverse of ritual helps them develop their own dispositions. And like, for example, in the, same, in the case of Sammy. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> and um, then it draws me on the question of what really decides and what really created these rituals in the first place? Yes. For example, um, we can force Sam to say please and thank you. Yep. But what, does, what do these rituals really mean in, like, how would they create it? They were created enough for a purpose. And how do you pick out rituals to, like, per se, play around with? 
to develop that sense of disposition. Because yes. I do believe that playing with the wrong kind of rituals also yeah. builds you, help you build a kind of yes. like a bizarre kind of disposition. And yes. that was my concern. Uh, yeah, wonderful question. Thank you. So let me begin with the Sammy example and then use that to answer at a larger level how we might deal with this. So to begin with the Sammy example, um, so that's the please and thank you ritual that, that we do in America and you know, the variations of this throughout the world. So the please thank you ritual, you can date this and trace this, I mean, historically. So when did it arise? It actually arose with the, in Europe with the development of markets. This is significant, so we're talking about a couple of centuries ago. This is significant because this was a social world in which everything in Europe was based upon birth, right? So let's jump back to say the 18th century. You're born into a world in which you're an aristocrat or you know, at this level, an aristocrat here, a peasant here, a peasant there. In other words, everything is ranked, it's defined purely by birth and where you were born will define your entire existence, period, for the rest of your life. And therefore, when you talked to people in the 18th century, you talked up or you talked down. If you're a high aristocrat, you're talking down to a peasant or a servant. If you're a lower, you're talking up, which means you would never say the equivalent of a please and thank you. It's, yes, sir, <laughs> if you're looking up, or you do this if you're looking down. Please and thank you begins to emerge when markets begin to emerge. And when markets begin to emerge in Europe, people begin buying and selling as if, to use that key expression that's so important to Asian philosophy, as if they're equal. No, they're not, right? I mean, you're still walking into the marketplace defined by birth, and so you still have this ranking, but when you're buying the vegetables from the farmer who's come to the market, you act as if you are equal. And you say, oh, are these the latest vegetables? Yes, could I please have this many? Thank you. And you hand over the money. And you create a ritual in which you act as if you're equals. And this ritual historically becomes important. That's where people begin developing the dispositions of what it would mean to interact with another human being as if they were equal, which again, at that stage, they weren't. <laughs> but you're developing the dispositions of what it would mean to do so. And we know historically that becomes an incredibly important set of dispositions, not that we live in an equal society, to put it mildly, but we are continuing to try to develop the dispositions of what that would mean. It proves, in other words, to be an historically incredibly powerful ritual. Now, this only cuts to the heart of your question. What about bad rituals? <laughs> Don't we also have horrible, horrible bad rituals that we would not want to be submitted to? The answer is, Yes, but when you're Sammy, you know, when you're three years old, you are being submitted to rituals. Sammy can't choose whether to do a ritual or not. I do think the please and thank you one is a good one. There are lots of rituals in America that I think are horrible. Poor Sammy can't choose. He's told to do them. <laughs> but if Sammy then, as he starts developing in the ways that we're talking ethically, beginning to sense the world around him, he then begins to sense what rituals are working and what rituals are not working. When Sammy has children, he may well choose to continue the please and thank you because I think that's a good ritual. Other rituals that we currently do in America, I hope poor Sammy will not do. And the reason this is important, getting back to the heart of your question is, when you're young, you kind of don't choose your rituals. But as you're training yourself, you do, right? As you're training yourself, you begin to sense this type of an exercise works, this one doesn't. I mean, at FUV, this is what you're doing in experimentation. Like, this type of a classroom designed this way in which we're reading these works and asking these questions, this generates incredible intense excitement. If we do it in this other way, it doesn't work. And often it's counterintuitive what works and what doesn't work. But you experiment and you try. And if you have that attitude of, I am going to experiment with these different rituals, with these different modes of interaction, and see what helps me develop and helps those around me to develop, then you're going to be developing rituals that really work. And if you're not doing this, then they become habits. And habits 
are dangerous. <laughs> Even seemingly good rituals, if it simply becomes a habit, if poor Sammy just says, please and thank you all of his life, it's a really bad ritual. And so what this means, getting back to the, the key question, is it comes down to the work of experimenting as to what is helping us train ourselves, what isn't, that will often be counterintuitive, what works in one historical epic will not at all work in another historical epic, what we may need to be doing a century from now may not be please and thank you. We may need radically different sorts of rituals, but we will, <laughs> undoubtedly. Will we find them? We'll find them if we experiment. We'll find them if we're trying to experiment with how we can be growing as human beings. And again, it doesn't mean we'll ever come up with a perfect set of rituals. It means on the opposite, we never will. We'll always be working on rituals, shifting them, changing things, and that's the key work of being ethical. And it's never ending, but unbelievably exciting. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, you talk yes. about, sorry. Um, go ahead. Yep. Okay, Thanks, sorry, Michael. Um, um, my question is kind of re related, so I want to get, 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 get it in. Um, I agree with your conclusions, but I have some questions about uh, um, how you get there through Eastern yep. philosophy. Yep. Um, um, Confucianism emerged within the context of imperialism and, and, and a certain desire to, to rule the country in a certain way. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon for modern philosophers to characterize this as even uh, um, maintaining a certain kind of inequality that's socially acceptable, right? And, and, and maybe even repressive. I mean, Vietnam shares a history with Confucianism as much as China does. And, and there is a history of re Confucianism being used to maintain a certain type yep. of inequality. Absolutely. So how, how, how do you reconcile that apparent conflict? Yes, a great question, and you're right, directly related to the, the latter question too. And here again, let me give an historical example, in this case in terms of, of Confucianism, to give an answer in terms of its larger implications for us. So, absolutely. But, of course, when this first emerges, so for example, when that quotation of submit yourself to rituals to become good, when that statement's being made, of course, this is pre-empire, right? And so this is being made at a time not unlike 18th century France, when everything was based upon birth. So China, that we're going back to, to 8th, 7th, 6th centuries BCE, it's an aristocratic society, everything is, being born, everything is defined by birth, and early Confucian teachings is all about breaking that. It's all about breaking these hierarchies, creating a meritocracy in which people will be judged by merit, not judged by birth, in which people will be training themselves, and those training themselves best will be the ones moving into leadership positions as opposed to those in leadership positions being those born into it. So it's a very self-conscious attempt to break rituals that will break down these hierarchies. Now, this is the key point that goes back to the very question too. The rituals depend on how you use them. So getting to the heart of your question, absolutely right. And let me just give a, an extreme example that's become very important for the world we're now living in in East Asia. So beginning in the 12th century, um, all of this changes. So there's a whole movement that we now categorize under the term Neo-Confucianism, which literally, and that literally this is said in so many words, so it's not even an interpretation, it's a self-proclaimed goal. The goal was to use these rituals for social control, exactly as you said. And so, for example, a text was written called The Family Rituals, in which many of these rituals that we were talking about, which were all about role reversals, the role reversals are taken out. <laughs> It's amazing. And I mentioned before this role reversal where the father plays the son to his son, the whole attempt to see the world from the opposite perspective. That very ritual is made into a new ritual in which, and literally, this is the way it's put, you do the ritual to train yourself to be a proper son to follow you, the father. And there's no role reversal. And the reason it's put together in a book called The Family Rituals is every member of the family is given a set of rituals to do to train them to be in that social position and never change. Explicitly, getting back to your point, which is absolutely right, to create a social hierarchy that will never change. Not surprisingly, states at the time 
loved this idea, <laughs> loved it. And so, yes, the empires take this on. They take it on not only in China, but yes, indeed. Korea, Japan, North Vietnam, it's introduced. And this becomes the system that we now come to think of as Confucianism because this is the reinterpretation that absolutely becomes the state orthodoxy throughout East Asia. So getting back to the heart of your question, the answer is yes. <laughs> in, uh, and yes in a strong sense. In other words, rituals are not inherently good or bad. They can be used to train us. They can be used for social control. They can be used to break down hierarchies. They can be used to explicitly create hierarchies and keep people in a rigid state. In that Neo-Confucian version, this isn't ritual along the lines we were discussing earlier. This is trying to make you stay with habits and patterns. And needless to say, a lot of states and a lot of empires would like us to stay with, with our, within our patterns and habits. It's you know, the Google model, <laughs> but at a state level. So getting back to the heart of the question, it's how you use these rituals. It's what you do with them. Think of ritual as training. If you're thinking of ritual as training, then you're breaking out of patterns. If, or when, I should say, when rituals are made into habitual things that you're forced to do to keep you in a certain hierarchy, be very aware, be very afraid, I should say, because that is precisely what we're trying to avoid. And the fact that the word ritual is used for both is, I think, telling, because it's, it can be an incredibly powerful vision for growth. It can be an incredibly successful way to find our patterns and keep us in them forever throughout our entire lives. So yes, it's the Google model at a state level. And states love to do this to us. And we need to beware because we are very easily manipulated by them. So yeah, wonderful example. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. So we have time for one last question. I would like to direct that question to the man standing yes. out there. Yeah? Um, Thank you. Thank you. You talk uh, about a scary future in which uh, our life could be easily manipulated if our private data are concentrated in the hands of a handful of people. So by saying so, are you anticipating a future of digital dictatorship? And if so, what should be done to prevent that from happening? A wonderful question and a strong yes to the first question. I think that's exactly the danger. I think the danger is we are moving, and I, I love your terms, so I'll stick with it. I think we're moving to a realm of digital dictatorship. I think it's beautifully put, in which all of our data will become so well known, all of our habits and patterns will become so well known, we will simply be controlled and manipulated without our even realizing it when we're doing something with that we think is fun and freeing, namely, you know, jumping on an internet and going through lots of sites. In fact, we're being controlled and we're being manipulated. I think digital dictatorship is a perfect way of putting it. And how do we break out of this? Well, I'll mention two things. Number one, we have got to start breaking our own habits and got to, to learn to see when we're being manipulated when we're being controlled and to allow ourselves the possibility of breaking these patterns and not being controlled by them. If we don't do that, we will be controlled by them. So we must do the work we've been mentioning. And if we're doing this and beginning the work of doing this, then the other thing we need to do is to start changing the powers that be that are creating this digital dictatorship, including, to go back to the first question, those in Google who may think they're doing this entirely for beneficent reasons, wonderfully growing the population in all sorts of exciting ways, in fact, they're not. But the fact that they may not realize what they're doing makes it all the more dangerous. And so if we begin breaking our habits, if we become the sorts of people who won't be so easily manipulated by powers that be, then we need to pose the next question. How do we change the powers that be? How would we, for example, use artificial intelligence in ways that would actually allow us to grow as individuals, grow as human communities? Could we use AI to help us break out of our habits, to break out of our patterns, to really connect with others? I think the answer to that is clearly absolutely yes. 
I mean, the simple fact of the matter is we, using artificial intelligence, can now truly create a global community at a level impossible even a few decades ago. It's extraordinary what we could be doing with this technology. And instead, we're allowing it to control us. Imagine if we did the opposite. Imagine if we break out of our habits and then start using these technologies in ways that could allow us to connect, that could allow us to create a cosmopolitan global community, that could allow us as human beings to connect with each other and create worlds where we and generations to come could flourish. That would be extraordinary. And whether that happens depends entirely on how we use them. It goes back to the earlier question. Do we use rituals to control ourselves and allow ourselves to be controlled, or do we use them to grow? Do we use artificial intelligence to allow ourselves to be controlled by digital dictatorship, or do we use it to allow ourselves to grow as human beings? That's up to us. It's up to us as to how we live our lives and how we use this work. How we use the rituals, how we use computers, how we use an internet, and if we don't, the implications are dire. If we do, the possibilities are probably beyond what any of us could now imagine. And much of, to speak in grand terms, the fate of humans and probably most of the other species on the planet may come down to how we do this in the decades to come. So thank you. That's a wonderful <laughs> way to, to bring our conversation to a conclusion. And so thank you both for that wonderful question and at a larger level, thank you all for being part of this. The conversation has been wonderful. I've so loved being here with you all. And I look forward to many more conversations, hopefully, hopefully with each of you and at a larger level as we, as a species, try to wrestle with these key questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Pruitt, thank you so much for the talk. And um, we at Fulbright, we prepared a special present for you. And I would like to invite on stage Dr. Ryan Derby Talbot, Chief Academic Officer of Fulbright University of Vietnam, to come on stage and pre present the, the present. Thank you so much. Uh, that was an incredibly stimulating talk. I think the seeds of this conversation will last for a long time. I want to thank you so much for making the trip to Vietnam and helping bring ideas of the world to Fulbright. One of our missions is to be a place where we can have an exchange of world ideas. And I'm so grateful um, and on a personal level continuing to think a lot about those ideas from the talk. So thank you so much on behalf of the university for making the trip here and speaking uh, in this fashion to Vietnam and uh, students and friends and citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let me also take the opportunity to turn the thanks to thank you, to thank you personally and everyone here at FUV for all you are doing. This, as I mentioned before, more than any other educational institution I have yet encountered, is truly living up to these goals. I have never seen ethics put into practice to the degree to which you are doing it here. And this is really an inspiration, I think, to all of us in not just the educational world, but really all of us in general about what we could become as human beings. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.